Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live stream at Monticello. My name is Laura Michael Balderson, and I am a guide here at Monticello. And today we will be talking with Mr. Jefferson about games and entertainment. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, I beg your pardon. That uh, was not a game of chance that I'm endeavoring uh, myself. Uh, well, well, welcome here uh, to our Monticello once again. And uh, I'm very delighted that we have Laura Michael Balderson with us to engage your questions uh, and questions already that we have received. Uh, this, of course, uh, devoted to entertainment and to gaming. Uh, I've always enjoyed uh, the games that uh, are played uh, with family and friends and um, not to be mixed with politics. <laughs> I've made that decisive in some of my writings. So this time uh, with all of us uh, devoted to the pleasures of gaming and entertainment. So uh, Laura Michael, whatever may be the first question of our gathering, I'm interested to hear. Well, Mr. Jefferson, when you were a young boy growing up at Shadwell Farm, we know you enjoyed music and conversation, um, but what were some of your favorite amusements, such as maybe card games or board games? Well, I will tell you first and foremost, when you say card games or board games, I believe you're uh, referring to what you might endeavor indoors. Now, that is not to say you could not go out of doors to engage such games. In fact, uh, with my grandchildren, I often want to play chess out of doors on the lawn. But when I was a child, oh, my greatest entertainment, my greatest games were found out of doors uh, in the pleasure of nature itself. A uh, horseback riding, if you will, uh, running long distances. Um, those were my pleasures. Now, that's not to say that I would forego games. No, I enjoyed uh, the roll and hoop. I enjoyed nine pins, of course. Uh, and uh, let's not discount uh, singing and storytelling. Do you know if there was one thing that preoccupied me growing up, it was going a visiting. Uh, visiting with my relations, visiting with our family friends. And whenever we would go a visiting, either to others' houses or when others would come visit with us at Shadwell, where I was born and grew up as a young boy, uh, well, storytelling, family stories, stories and uh, curiosities, if you will, in, in history uh, and in society. These would preoccupy us and were considered very much uh, game playing of what, uh, where and how we found amusement. So after um, living at Shadwell Farm, you grew up a little bit, you attended the College of William and Mary. Uh -huh. um, were there different uh, entertainment options that you enjoyed there uh, separate from um, home? Surely being in the colonial capital was a little bit different than the options available to you in rural Virginia. Oh, yes. Well, what one as a student at the old Royal College of William and Mary would certainly engage, engage uh, were card games. Oh, yes. Considered by many games of chance. And so it was, I was not alone in that effort. And there was a horse betting at horse races. Uh, yes, that always considered to, to be a game. Uh, but if there was one particular game in which I found the greatest of pleasure, chess. I took up playing chess when I was a young man, particularly attendant at the Old Royal College of Women Mary. And the gentleman with whom I enjoyed playing chess more than any other was my good friend, Johnny Page, Johnny Page of Roseville. In fact, I would visit Page at Roseville there across the York River, and we would engage games of chess for many, many hours. Uh, my pleasure in playing chess has remained with me my entire life. But the earliest instances, the earliest pleasures uh, were there when I was a young man attending the Old Royal College of William and Mary. Now, later, when I began to read law with Mr. George Witt, well, I would endeavor playing chess with Mr. Witt. In fact, Mr. Witt and I would play games of chess even earlier, before I read law with him, uh, in the company of my teacher at the Old Royal College of William and Mary, uh, Dr. William Small. And... When we gathered at the governor's palace during the administration of Governor Francis Falkier in what we referred to as our party quarry, 
in which I have said I heard more good conversation spoken than in my entire life besides, well, yes, chess was frequently a game uh, to occupy us. Uh, later, while I was an attorney on the circuit attending to the county courts, uh, let alone the general court in Virginia, I would bring my chess board and, uh, and chess pieces with me. I remember upon one occasion I wanted to play with uh, Mr. Jack Walker, Colonel Walker, John Walker, a classmate of mine at the Old Royal College, and uh, I remember we corresponded as to where we would meet and who would bring the chess board and who would bring the chess pieces. Uh, so this was a great pleasure we had uh, while uh, practicing law. And of course, chess is a game in which, if you will, uh, strengthens the mind, uh, strengthens the mind with the element of forethought. Chess is a game of forethought. And of course, as an attorney pleading cases and the like in defense of prosecution, forethought is so very, very necessary uh, in your strategy uh, as an attorney. So I'm very happy to have picked up the game of chess uh, when I was a young student at the Old Road College of William & Mary, it fulfilled many of my leisure hours as a young man, uh, both at the Old Road College, reading law, practicing law, uh, through when I entered public service uh, as a Burgess in the old house of Burgesses. Now, this is not to say I would forego a, a game of, of pitchers. Oh, pitchers, uh, I think, uh, becoming well known as a game of quoits, uh, or simply people refer to it as horseshoes. Um, but pitchers oftentimes would mean simply pitching a coin uh, to see how close you could come to a particular mark. A quoits, if you will, were uh, round pieces, um, sometimes out of wood, sometimes uh, out of iron, uh, that you would toss uh, so that you might be so fortunate to have that quoit hit directly upon a, uh, a spiked mark. So that was a pleasure, accordingly, that I enjoy enjoyed when I was a, a young man there in Williamsburg City. Well, we have some follow-up questions, particularly about chess. Um, so one question is, uh, who won, you or George With? It would not be wise for me to cast the perspersions upon those who are not here to speak for themselves, but I would say that um, equally, equally, we were able to master our games of chess with one and the other, the one to win uh, at a certain game, the other at the next game. And of course, these games of chess would go on for hours. Uh, I remember uh, having enjoying a game of chess. Uh, this was in, uh, I believe it was Philadelphia City, uh, with Mr. Madison, James Madison, most adept at the playing of, the, of chess. The game went on for four hours. So I was wont to play chess with many, many people uh, over my many years. And as I mentioned, I still enjoy playing chess with my grandchildren. So with the respect to Mr. Whip, uh, I give him all honor uh, with reflecting upon the many games uh, that he won in match with me. Well, Chester would like to know, speaking of your grandchildren, uh, who would win in a chess game between yourself and your granddaughter, Ellen Randall? Oh, Eleanor. Well, I say that because she became more and more perfect at the game. And who would I be to assume that she could not outmaster me uh, in a game of chess? Uh, I'm not going to say that uh, she won all of them, but there were many occasions in which I thought it most proper that she should continue to the checkmate upon my king. Well, we know um, that there were um, times in which you uh, and your late wife, Mrs. Jefferson, uh, hosted friends and family. What sorts of entertainments did you enjoy sharing with them? Oh, Mrs. Jefferson was so devoted to the games that she would play growing up as a young girl, very much a part of the Tidewater Society. That's how we first met when I went to Williamsburg as a young man. And she was attendant there in Williamsburg City uh, at music house and soirees, very uh, proficient upon the spinet. Uh, but then, of course, she had a long line of suitors attendant to her. Uh, when we married, 
uh, then of course the two of us as husband and wife embarked upon the social circuit. Uh, we went to visiting, as I mentioned earlier, which was expected of the, um, well, Tidewater Society at that time, let alone even out here progressively uh, in the frontier, in the wilderness, in the Piedmont. And Mrs. Jefferson, I will tell you, was quite proficient at the game of cards. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, I would that she had been the more successful uh, because there were occasions in which I... Um, well, I had to provide the money. So, yes, again, cards, a game of chance. And I would provide the monies uh, for her uh, as she had to ante up or pay at a loss. I remember in January, oh, January, the winter months are the months in which we preoccupy ourselves in, in gaming more than any other months of the year, because that is predominantly when we are indoors. But uh, Mrs. Jefferson and I were visiting her family at the forest in Charles City County. Uh, this was back in about the year uh, 1774. Uh, we had married, of course, two years previous. We were living uh, here at Monticello in that small little cottage, which I built as a hermitage, and which, as you know, became our honeymoon cottage. But this January of 1774, uh, Mrs. Jefferson was not so fortunate as a particular game at a particular game of cards of chance. And so as I discovered in my memorandum book the other day, I had to provide for her a, a shilling three pence uh, in her losses. <laughs> now, I will tell you too that Mrs. Jefferson was uh, quite the singer, wish I could boast the same. And when we gathered uh, during the war uh, here at Monticello with many of the Hessian officers, uh, you know, the Hessians were barracked as prisoners of war, along what is still the barracks road here in Charlottesville. There were two particular families, the Von Redesels, who resided at Colley Farm, and the Von uh, Gismars. Well, the Von Redesels would visit uh, Mrs. Jefferson and I here at Monticello. We would visit them at uh, Colley Farm, and we would enjoy family sing-alongs. We would enjoy family stories. Uh, and yes, we enjoyed cards, and you can imagine I enjoyed playing chess with the Baron. Uh, but we also enjoyed talking about books that we were reading, uh, books that we held in pleasure with one and the other. I remember upon one occasion, this was um, uh, immediately after the victory at Yorktown, uh, the French Marquis de Chastelot uh, came to visit me here at Monticello. And uh, of course, we enjoyed playing chess one and the other. He delighted in Mrs. Jefferson's proficiency uh, in cards. And we would often spend hours simply discussing the, the stories of Ossian, written by McPherson, that occupied us for hours. So again, I emphasize the storytelling, the storytelling particularly about books that you were favoring and reading to share with others uh, were very much a part of gaming. Well, Mr. Jefferson, while you traveled in Europe, we know that you came into contact with new ideas and new food. Did you learn any new games that were not well known in America? Charades. That was something that was practiced often at the various salons. You know, the salons that would gather once a week, both the, the ladies' salons and the gentlemen's salons, uh, were renowned for the games that were played there in that French society, the society, of course, uh, of the court of Louis XVI and his queen. Uh, and so charades was a game that would often be played amongst the French. Oh, my heavens, what wonderful events they were. Uh, the French certainly know how, how to engage fun uh, in playing games. Well, the French know how to engage fun in everyday life. Uh, that joie de vie that I have brought back with me. Uh, I remember, too, that when I first set out uh, upon Paris and its many discoveries for me, uh, I was invited by Dr. Franklin to the um, Salon de Echec. That was a, um, a chess club uh, in Paris. And so I set about realizing that uh, chess was played uh, very much for the winner or the loser to ante up monies. Well, I lost that first game of chess that I engaged at the Salon de Hesquet in, uh, in Paris and refused from that moment on ever to play chess competitively 
uh, that is for remuneration. I am reminded of a story, I'm reminded of a story of dear Dr. Franklin, uh, when he was in the company of the Duchess de Bourbon, uh, and of course the Austrian monarch, uh, Joseph II. Uh, Joseph II would travel about the kingdoms of Europe amassed, if you will, not physically, but in his identity as the, um, the Comte de Frankens, uh, Falkenstein, the Comte de Falkenstein. Uh, and so it was that they were all at a gathering uh, playing chess, uh, Dr. Franklin uh, and the Duchess de Bourbon. And it came to the point where uh, Dr. Franklin put the Duchess's king uh, in checkmate. Well, he went further than that. Dr. Franklin took the Duchess's king, kept him for himself. And eyewitnesses exclaimed that the Duchess de Bourbon said, oh, Monsieur le Docteur, we do not do that in France. You cannot take my, my king. To which Dr. Franklin replied, oh, madam, in America, that is what we do. <laughs> A delightful story indeed. So uh, when you think about the games to be played in French society, it almost pales when you realize the greater opportunities of entertainment you have to go to the theater, the theater Francaise, the theater Italien, uh, to go to organ recitals at, uh, uh, at, at the great cathedrals there, Notre Dame and Bobostre and his artistry. Oh, I... I would be endless if I were to continue upon the entertainments and games that one could seek out uh, in Paris. Mr. Jefferson, you um, brought up Benjamin Franklin here, and Michelle would like to know who you consider the more daunting opponent in a game of strategy between Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton. And before <laughs> you answer, I will remind you that it is Mr. Hamilton's birthday, so we should speak of him accordingly. <laughs> I appreciate the reminder. I certainly do. Of an individual I have frequently spoken, um, was no less a hero. Uh, as a man, he was honorable in his business, amiable in society. Uh, and yes, quite adept at the game of chess. But I can assure you this, for Dr. Franklin and General Hamilton to be seated together and playing a game of chess, well, I would be historically incorrect were I to say uh, General Hamilton was more often the victor. No, Dr. Franklin, most adept. Dr. Franklin wrote rules on, the, on playing the game of chess. In fact, as I was referring earlier to the opportunity uh, in Dr. Franklin's company at the Salon de Check in Paris, do you know their Salon had its own book on playing chess? Dr. Franklin was familiar with it. It helped influence in his perfection in that game, so much so that I, thinking I could perfect the game of chess, also purchased uh, that book of the Salon is Check in Paris. It is in my library. You're welcome to see it. Um, I believe that General Hamilton may have known about it. Uh, General Hamilton, as you know, never had the opportunity to sail to France or to England. So he might have been somewhat devoid of that greater idea of perfecting the game of chess than Dr. Franklin already was so well accomplished in. Very respectfully said of both gentlemen. Um, and speaking of people who you were um, working with in politics, you lived in both New York City and Philadelphia, uh, and you also lived in the president's house in Washington, D.C. Um, and what sorts of entertainment did you partake in there? And were there any new um, games that were um, had come with the founding of our country? Hmm. A very good question indeed. I believe I made mentioned earlier that I am not very much a proponent of mixing game playing cards uh, with politics. Uh, as you're reminding me of uh, living firstly in New York, where our government was seated for several months, that was the spring uh, of 1790, and then removing our government to Philadelphia. We were there a uh, good 10 years while we were building our new capital along the banks of the Potomac. Uh, I'm reminded of the many British influences in our first two administrations. 
uh, the administration of President Washington uh, there in New York, later in Philadelphia, the, ex the administration of President Adams uh, in Philadelphia, and then the last few months uh, in Washington City. Uh, there was much card playing, card parties. Oh, yes, General Washington favored card parties. And I was sent many an invitation to the president's house, uh, particularly in Philadelphia. And um, well, history will account that I turned down a great many of them. No, again, I found my greater pleasure in simply perusing a good book or in my attentions to the patent office. Because remember, as Secretary of Foreign Affairs, as the department was first referred to, later the Department of State, uh, the patent office fell under uh, my jurisdiction. So I was far more beguiled with the ingenuity of the American mind at that time. So if you ought to say, did we create anything as a new nation in the realm of entertainment, uh, I would like to say it was in the realm of ingenuity, improvement, and uh, new inventions and creations that would benefit not only ourselves, but also the creator themselves. Remember, they had the opportunity to receive remuneration for the creativity of their own mind. Now, if it sounds as if I'm somewhat skirting your particular question, uh, no, I, I would say that when our, when our government moved to Washington City and fell under my administration, I essentially, uh, well, rid the president's office of any of the British influence of levies. I thought they were far too royal, uh, far too uh, well, created for the purpose of formality and, and precedence. I created more of a laissez-faire, pell-mell uh, society gathering. Uh, I found most of my pleasures at the meal table with many who came to visit me in the president's house, the conversation that we would have about the meal table. And that is not to say that there were individuals with whom I enjoyed playing chess. Yes, of course. But then the opportunity provided was the fact that living in the great president's house, the new president's house in Washington City, with such a chamber as the East Room, well, there's where my grandchildren and many children would get together and play many games themselves uh, in the great East Room. Hide the slipper, for instance, they would play. Or the, the game where they would uh, uh, talk about uh, Robin's Alive. That was a game I remember as a young child. Robin's Alive, I passed it on to my children and my grandchildren. It merely meant that you would hold a piece of paper, uh, set it afire, and quickly recite a little rhyme. Uh, Robin's Alive, and so they should be. If they die in my hand, oh, I should not go further. But you would pass it on to the next person, the next person who would have to recite the same. And if the piece of paper burned down, well, obviously, they had lost. So that was a game that I had begun in my youth and passed on through the years, even into the president's house, uh, as my grandchildren gathered in the great East Room. Well, speaking of your grandchildren, um, now in your retirement, uh, you see your grandchildren very often. Um, and what sorts of games do you enjoy playing with them and with your many guests here? Well, I enjoy um, games mostly out of doors, as I made mentioned earlier, particularly races, uh, when the children of the neighborhood, let alone my grandchildren, gather here on the, uh, the West Lawn. Uh, we often engage races. And um, I will often, uh, if you will, uh, hold up my handkerchief uh, there as they all gather in line at one end of the West Lawn. And when I drop the handkerchief, that is when they are to make their advance as swiftly as they possibly can. And there is always a reward for those races accordingly. Uh, for the winner, there are, uh, well, uh, three figs or three dates, whatever we may have on hand. For uh, the runner-up in second, there are two figs, two dates. Uh, and for the third, uh, one. So that no one really loses out entirely. And maybe the other two who have advanced beyond the third might share uh, their rewards uh, with their grandchildren. I mentioned also that Eleanor and I enjoy playing chess out of doors. And then there is a particular game. Uh, I heard about it, or shall I say, my grandchildren informed me about it, a, a game called Goose. 
I was not very familiar with it, but I sought it out. I sought it out in order to introduce uh, to my, my family. And very happily, I was able to procure for them uh, the game of goose. I wish I had uh, the board or the map that you would unfold and lay upon a board uh, to show you its intriguing um, diagram, uh, if you will. Uh, played with uh, pieces uh, very much in this fashion, a little animals such as a squirrel or, or a cat. And uh, then what you do is you roll dice in order that you might advance uh, your particular piece uh, along the squares uh, on that map. And there were 63 squares designed in a diagram that would eventually bring you to the middle uh, of that game. Now, the one who would arrive on that 63rd square at the mid in the middle of the, the map would, of course, be the winner. So what would prohibit others? Well, simply, as you would roll the dice and advance that number of spaces, you might land on a space in which there was the drawing of a goose. Yes, a goose in various um, forms of its fluffing its feathers or squawking, if you will, and that perhaps the, the sound that squawk, that meant you would have to forfeit that number of spaces and go back. So that was the game of goose that we began to enjoy here uh, at our Monticello as I took leave of public office and have come home. Mr. Jefferson, can you also talk to us a little bit about the camera obscura and what sorts of fun one can have with that object? Oh, my, my, what an intriguing, intriguing creation it certainly is and has been from time immemorial. At best, I can describe it as um, a box, uh, a box which has at one end a little pinhole, and then at the other end, you might have... Um, well, a plate of glass, you may have a, a mirror, you might have a sheet of paper, and you place it in front of any object, as I may do now in front of you all, and your image will come in through that little pinhole, the condensing of the light, if you will, in the image, and it would splay out into a much greater image upon that back surface. Now, it has advanced, and when I say advanced, it has advanced from the most ancient days from the times of the Greeks, from the times of the Romans. This was often played out, if you will, uh, in rooms that would have a very small aperture at one end, and then whatever uh, has been uh, outside of that room through that aperture would be reflected on an entire wall on the opposite side. Well, the camera obscure that I have here at Monticello, and I hope you will have the opportunity to come visit indoors, to see it distinctly, uh, is a box with just exactly the same, uh, a small op opening on one hand of the box, and then on the opposite end is a mirror. And the mirror reflects the image to the top of the box, which has a, more or less a plate of glass. You look in through an uh, aperture, an opening on the top of the box to that plate of glass. And the camera obscure has advanced to the point where you are actually able to draw as real as possible of that image that is coming through that small little aperture, aperture at the beginning reflected uh, from the mirror. Now, of course, the problem with it, it it's backwards in all essence of uh, what you can achieve. But they're working on it. They're working on it. And from what I hear, the French are in an advance on this to suggest that if you coat the plate of glass there on the very top that will receive the reflection from the mirror beneath it, if you coat it with silver nitrate, that the light will actually burn the reality of the image upon that plate of glass. Now talk about uh, an amusement. Uh, talk about uh, an invention, a creation. Can you imagine what could be beguile us for hours, people coming from all over someday to have their image made perfectly uh, within a camera obscura. Uh, would it have to remain backwards, or could there be some method to improve upon it that would be uh, in reality uh, of the image itself, uh, more precisely as it turned? So this uh, remains unto the future. This remains unto you. I should only hope I might live to see it. 
for what a reality this could capture of the past. Mr. Jefferson, what um, games and entertainment did enslaved families participate in and when are they able to enjoy them? Yes, I'm very worthy and a very good question. One relative, of course, to time and leisure. You bring to mind, we reflect upon, as I've written, those who labor for my happiness. As we're meeting here, uh, these winter months, uh, it is the time of year, perhaps more than any other time of year, that those who labor for my happiness have the opportunity to enjoy their games, uh, to enjoy, if you will, uh, music and singing and dance, but more so to enjoy the games that they have uh, created themselves with, with marbles, clay marbles. Playing marbles is, is a game that they enjoy with the one marble there and to flick the other. And you hit it from a distance or will you come close by? The one to hit it and move it, of course, to be the victor. Uh, oftentimes as well, uh, they will engage um, the jaw harp. Uh, I should not try to affect it myself. It would uh, not be worthy of me to uh, make perfection of this as can be achieved by others. But this is a great pleasure uh, that they take up. Uh, so these are some of the pleasures that, uh, that those who can find their leisure hours, the more so this time of year than they can the rest of the year, uh, I want to pursue uh, and enjoy. Um, when I think of music uh, as a pleasure and an entertainment uh, for them, I think of, uh, of Beverly Hemings who has become most proficient uh, upon the fiddle. That is Sally Hemings' son. And uh, he himself has become quite renowned for bringing everyone together in most pleasurable moments, happy moments, uh, particularly during this winter time. It is an element uh, of leisure to which those who have been, uh, well, born, to the society that I mentioned earlier, have a lot more of throughout the entire year. And we can only hope that uh, this may become the opportunity for so many now, as I've mentioned, who labor for my happiness. Well, Mr. Jefferson, we're gonna finish uh, with one last question, um, which is one that I am very interested in. Uh, there have been times when you have paid um, for the privilege of seeing animals, tigers, elephants, monkeys. Can you tell us um, how these opportunities came up and why you felt this was an important use of time and money? And also, if you think there are entertainments that should not be paid for. Let me approach firstly the entertainment that should not be paid for. Uh, as I mentioned, I was talking about cards earlier, and I have gone to the extent to make certain in the plans for our University of Virginia that uh, games of chance will be prohibited. Absolutely. I, I do not think that it is the use of time uh, for our students at the university uh, to engage in games of chance. And in fact, I have asked uh, that the monies that are allotted to the students by their families be kept from them and only to be allowed the students uh, in increments of allowance uh, throughout their terms at the university. So this will not allow them were they to have more access to monies to engage more readily in games of chance in betting uh, and the like. Uh, I do not believe so much in the, in the game of billions uh, for remuneration. Now, many have asked me, well, Mr. Jefferson, do you have a billion table uh, at your home? I, I hear this quite frequently. Some say that it is above stairs in, in the dome room. Well, not to my knowledge. If it's there, I did not put it there. Uh, there could be one uh, uh, later in time that I may not know of at present. So I'm telling you now, uh, I do not care for brilliance. Yes, of course, I know of it. Um, but no, not for the, for the purpose of, uh, of extracting monies from one who has lost at that particular game. Now then, you're asking me about uh, a great pleasure of mine, and that is simply paying money to go see an exotic 
animal. Yes, precisely, an exotic animal. Where are you to see a tiger any day of your life, whether it be out here in the wilderness or, or back east in the tidewater of Virginia, let alone in Philadelphia City, New York, or as far north as I have traveled to Portsmouth in New Hampshire? You'll never see a tiger. You'll never see an elephant. You'll never see a monkey. Uh, nor will you ever see a learned pig. Oh, yes, I am distinct upon that statement. I had the opportunity to pay money to see a learned pig while I was in London. Yes, the idea was that this pig could actually decide upon which card to attract from a deck. Now, the amusement was not only to see the pig animated as he was instructed uh, by the pig's owner, but also the curiosity was to discover how is the owner himself contriving a method by which perhaps it is not the pig, but he that has extracted the particular card. I paid to see an elephant. Absolutely. Who would not? An elephant being brought out so far to the west as Richmond town, uh, let alone as it made its way throughout our country to Baltimore, Washington City, and Philadelphia. They say it has even gone farther south into North Carolina. An elephant, imagine here on the continent of North America. So again, these are exotics. You have no other opportunity. Why not pay for that opportunity to see these marvels, these wonderful creations in nature? Does it not serve to open your mind and wonder where they are want to stalk this globe in great profusion uh, and how we might learn from them and learn further uh, the marvels uh, in nature. So I thank you for the question, Laura Michael. You are exactly uh, upon one of my great interests and great loves that I have pursued my entire life. Well, thank you, Mr. Jefferson, for sharing with us today. And thank you to everyone who's joined us online, um, viewing our live stream. We hope that you will join us next week as well uh, when we will have Marion Cohen with us, who will be talking about food preservation amongst the enslaved people here at Monticello. Have a great week, everyone.